Good afternoon and welcome to Catalan Cymru revision sessions. This session will focus on GCSE history and will be presented by Geraint Penny from Stanwell School. The session will last around 45 minutes where the teacher will go through the relevant subject content. If you have any questions, please use the question and answer section and we will endeavour to answer your question during the session. The session will be recorded with the recording of en and any relevant resources uploaded to the ESCOL website in the Catalan Cymru area. Thank you, away you go. Hello everybody. Right, just to confirm, this is the second session. It says on the front page that I'll concentrate on America and Germany. I can imagine most time will be spent on America. And in the third session, I'll add more information from Germany, uh, where I'll mostly stress um, and examine source material and examination technique. As you can see from the first slide, uh, I will focus on a number of key issues. I'm hoping to get through um, all of the American key issues, if not a good number of them. If I can just start by explaining, I'll go through one key issue at a time. So my, our first stop will be key issue one on the immigration topic. As you can see, I've included a few relevant uh, photographs here. The top left image shows Sacon Vanzetti, the two Italian immigrants and anarchists who were executed. Um, there's an image there of the Statue of Liberty, which was the, the great hope for many immigrants arriving near America. There's the image in the bottom right of the quota system, a method to try to restrict immigration. So if we can just start looking at the knowledge, just to confirm also the information is from the WJC knowledge organizers, which can be found easily on the WJC website. So if I can just start with the first aspect then. I focus first of all on the reasons for immigration. As you can see, there are many push and pull factors which made people immigrate to the United States. Push factors making them leave and pull factors which are bringing them in or pulling them in into the United States. For example, escaping from poverty would be a push factor. Escape from um, persecution at home, another pull. Um, tolerance, a push factor, a pull factor coming to the United States. A plentiful supply of land and the hope of owning opportunities and property, another um, pull factor from the United States. And of course, the idea of opportunity, equal opportunity and democracy and the fair um, chance in, to succeed in society. So they are some of the basic reasons why people wish to migrate to the USA. As you know, many people travel by sea from a long distance and their first sign was often the Statue of Liberty, but of course Ellis Island to be um, put through in an administrative sense. At the busiest periods, as many as 5,000 people a day were arriving there. Some as young as 24, and there's an image there of people leaving the boat to embark on their new part of their journey in life. Of course, many immigrants were regarded by Native Americans, by, by ordinary Americans, sorry, as potential communists, potential anarchists, and thus explaining the beginnings of the Red Scare. Indeed, many were frightened by the communist revolution in Russia in 1917, and they viewed the possibility of a similar event occurring in the United States. Hence the rise in xenophobia and the rise of greater suspicion of potential Reds. And unfortunately, many immigrants were tarred with the same brush that they would indeed be um, communists who might endanger the American way of life. Alongside this there were a number of different problems. For example, there were many cases of strikes in 1919. There were a number of bomb threats and bomb occasions, such as the one photographed here on Wall Street in 1920, killing 38 people. And of course, an infamous attempt to remove Mitchell Palmer's life, which then led to the Palmer raids, as we know. And many people saw communism as a real constant danger that threatened their way and their very existence. Two events stand out, of course, the first being the Palmer raids. The Attorney General Mitchell Palmer 
organised attacks against left-wing organisations. And there were rumours, of course, that they were a constant threat to America. Where indeed, you're talking a maximum of 0.1% of the population. One phrase we use is that they were as dangerous as a flea on an elephant. So perhaps the threat was one of exaggeration and caused by paranoia and unjustified paranoia, of course. Where does this leave us to? This leads us to the situation of restrictions against immigrants. Many began to question the open door policy that was in place. In particular, if the immigrants were what we know as new immigrants from Austria, Hungary, Russia, Italy, West Poland and Greece, for example. They often felt that these new immigrants were illiterate and poor and were different from what we know as WASP Americans. So unfortunately, immigrants faced a difficult time during the 1920s. Examples being the quota system. For example, 1921, only 3% of the total population of any overseas groups could come in after 21. Then there were further immigration changes in 1929. They had to sit a test to actually qualify in many cases, as in 1917 shown here. So you can surely see a number of things here. We've learned about the, the drives towards immigration, but also the reasons for mistrust of immigrants. And then the unfortunate outcome where we have America gradually closing its open door. That was a quick fire guide to key question one. Key question two is an intriguing subject regarding race and religion in America during the 1920s. If you want to pause a second and look at the images, you will see a few. The infamous terrorist group, the Ku Klux Klan in the centre. Segregation on the top left hand side. The monkey trial shown in the bottom right hand corner, the interest shown and Billy Sunday, just above that photograph, a well-known revivalist and fundamentalist. But I've also placed in the top, in the bottom left, an image of black resistance and black resilience. His name was Marcus Garvey, who wished to achieve back to Africa, as the nickname for his organisation goes. As we can see, black communities and other minorities were mistreated. They were not considered as real Americans and put down there. For example, they have to endure segregation via the Jim Crow laws, preventing them from having a good standard of education, of course. And there were numerous areas which enacted segregation, unfortunately. Secondly, the economic growth for the 20s seemed to leave many black Americans behind. Many went north in search of a better life in what we know as the Great Migration to places like Chicago, New York and Detroit. But yet, despite the no official segregation up north, they were still often treated as inferiors. Low wages, poor neighbourhoods, lack of opportunities. We often use the phrase first to be fired, last to be hired, which is quite symbolic of the difficulties they face. And of course, the, the KKK was a regular threat, in particular in the southern states. So in terms of religion, I've included two photographs here. The one on the right is Johnny Scopes, who, as you know, was arrested for ignoring the act against the teaching of Darwin's evolution. And he was taken to court as a result. And the map on the left shows you the situation with regards to the Bible Belt, the area, the deep south of the Bible Belt, where support for this banning was more popular. The case itself had a great deal of publicity in the media. You had two high profile lawyers on either side. Scopes was found guilty of teaching the theory of evolution to his pupils, and was fined $100, which is a lot of money in our present times. 
So what did it show us? It clearly showed a different side to America from the one portrayed in the so-called jazz age and the differences between religion and science and clearly showed the divisions within society, unfortunately, at this time. Key question three, it's also another very popular topic with the students. Four images in particular here, the celebration on the left side when prohibition had actually been repealed in December 33, and it was in place for 13 years. We often refer to it as the noble experiment. The second image shows the speakeasy in, at work with somebody trying to gain entry, probably via a secret code. Some people wanted prohibition removed, of course, on the right side, and some people benefited from it. The infamous and ever charming in the media, Al Capone is shown here as well. There's lots to learn about prohibition and corruption. I'll start with the corruption part. Warren Harding, as United States president, was a weak president in terms of his reputation, so he often gave influential posts to friends and peers, friends from back home, hence the term the Ohio Gang. There's a real sense of mistrust here due to several scandals, and I will go through three in particular on the next page. For example, conspiracy and bribery in the Veterans Bureau case with Charles Forbes. Second, of course, Albert Fall, who was fined and imprisoned for his part in the Teapot Dome scandal, which is basically um, a scandal regarding property sale, which he made an enormous amount of money from as a result. Probably a more shocking case than the second one was the Attorney General selling alcohol illegally and given licenses and pardons to offenders. Surprising, considering 1920s was a time of alcohol being banned in the prohibition case, of course. With regards to prohibition, we're going to start by looking at the reasons behind prohibition. A number of organizations known as the Dries, like the Anti-Saloon League, the ASL, and some religious groups like the Methodists put pressure on the government to prohibit the production and sale of alcohol. Some supporters claimed alcohol was the work of the devil. Increased crime led to productivity issues, led to domestic issues and child neglect. This resulted in the 18th Amendment to the Constitution, making it illegal to sell alcohol in the United States. So there are some of the causes of prohibition. But what about life? during prohibition, but well, demand for alcohol still remained high, so it was sold illegally. People like Al Capone and Bugs Moran we know of. Protection rackets were popular and gambling dens. Organised crime started and became a real issue at this time. Many people smuggled alcohol into America. These were called bootleggers. Many people made alcohol at home, what we call moonshiners. Speakeasies appeared, illegal drinking bars. Over 100,000 of these in New York alone. There was corruption with regard in the bribery of police officers, for example. And it was hard to enforce the Prohibition Act itself. There were not enough agents, were on low salaries and easy to bribe. It was hard to change people if they wished to drink. They were of a legal drinking age. They felt this was a real unjust way to change their lives. That was key question three. Now we're looking at quick key question four, the causes of the economic boom. Number four, you can see some images here. You can sense the, the boom in construction. You can also see mass production at work with the Ford Model T cars or tin leases on sale share and being produced in mass produced and standardized form. You can also see the importance of advertising in the top right hand corner. So why we ask, was there an economic boom? Well, for a start, America was rich 
of certain resources, timber, iron, coal, oil and land, for example, and a cheap immigrant workforce. A number of economies in Europe suffered during World War One, Germany in, in particular, but America moves forward with significant growth. US banks loaned money to Europe. So that as a result, it was an unprecedented economic boom at this time. Many homes had electricity as well. So obviously there was a demand for electrical consumer goods at this time. Furthermore, we can look at the car industry as the perfect example of mass production, producing affordable cars for the people of America. The more he made, the more he could reduce the prices. By 1925, $290 for a new car, which is significant. Some workers earned good wages, thousands of jobs were created, and other industries were helped as well, like petrol stations and road building and hotels and restaurants. This was helped by higher purchase and the use of credit. You could buy something by paying for it on a monthly basis. Advertising was an intriguing industry at that time as well. The radio and the newspapers and chain stores began to appear. I've included here a quite prominent and enticing advert on the right side, but also a closer look at the assembly lines or gravity slides, which made the Ford cars much cheaper and more effectively. Furthermore, there were other industries like chemicals, electrical goods and cars. Radio sets need certain attention, for example. 10 million was sold in 1929. Telephone equipment major rise. Building industry was busier than ever before. This changed America massively. Also the car industry at the bottom of the page used 90% of America's petrol and 80% of the country's rubber. So we have a multiplier effect helping other key industries here. So that was the boom and we went through a number of the key causes there. So what about key question five? How did this prosperity actually come to a close? Number five, if we pause for a second, we can see four distinct images here. Try to work out what you think the left photograph shows us here, the top left. You can surely see mass panic outside the Wall Street Stock Exchange here as a result of the over-speculation and the hysteria with regards to Wall Street. This hysteria is echoed in the photograph of the newspaper report. You can also see the desperation caused by the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression in the other two photographs here. So why on earth did we have this horrendous drop in the economic livelihood of America? Plenty sure. For example, perhaps it was due to overproduction in agriculture? Did farmers produce far too much due to confidence? And this then caused a fall in prices and a drop in profits. This under demand was significant. There were too many unsold consumer goods in the US. Maybe we we'll overestimate the wealthy nature of Americans. Perhaps those who could afford them already did so. Those who could not afford are more striking. So the supply was bigger than the actual demand, hence overproduction and under demand. Buying on credit was an issue as well, causing debt for some people. By the end of the 1920s, we have commercial problems. America tried to utilize the tariffs, but as a result, European countries retaliate and place a tax on American goods. As a consequence, American goods are too expensive to buy in Europe, so there's a lack of demand and trade worsens as a result. Furthermore, we can ally this to a property price drop. House prices fell after 26, even a number of Americans owning houses that were worth less money than what they'd originally paid. So these pressures are certainly appearing, aren't they? Furthermore, there were a lack of effective banking systems. 
there were too many small banks. Laissez-faire politics led to this lack of tight regulation. Many small banks that did not have the financial resources to cope with the rush for money when the Wall Street crash occurred, hence widening the crisis post-1929. What about the crash itself? We often call the crash the trigger event or the catalyst. We just look at the bottom right hand picture and try to work out what you think it represents. The photograph shows a person in quite wealthy attire in desperate times as he's trying to sell his car for a reduced price because he has clearly lost money on the Wall Street crash. So why do these people suddenly lose so much money? Well, perhaps the signs were there. A number of experts had warned the economy was slowing down. Some investors started to sell shares in large numbers. Maybe there had been too much over speculation before this. Maybe there were too many amateurs who bought shares and thus panicked beyond belief when prices started to drop. Then we have Black Thursday. 12.8 million shares were sold, a staggering and alarming amount. Thousands of people saw their fortune or any money they had in the bank disappear. By October 29th, the stock market had collapsed. And thus we had the end of the roaring 20s. So many investors lost their money in the crash and could not pay their debts. Hence the photograph in the right hand side of this poor gentleman who'd lost a significant amount of money. So that's one to five done. Number six, popular entertainment. You can see a variety here. The charming movie star, Charlie Chaplin, the inspiring Louis Armstrong, the jazz musician, famous movies such as The Jazz Singer, are all shown here. The two main types of entertainment would be jazz music and the cinema. If we can just spend some time looking at the cinema, first of all, so why is it so popular? Is it to do with the fashions, the way which people behaved, where people were learning from people on the large screen? Every small town had a cinema. Many people with more disposable income due to uh, working changes, due to less taxation, could go once a week or even more. It was reasonably cheap to enter the cinema also. Was it the attraction of Hollywood itself? Was it to do with the marketing of certain movies, different genres of films like cowboy movies, detective stories, etc.? All this resulted in a real interest and fascination in the movie stars, what we often call the, the star system. Cinemas were pleasant places where people could socialise and enjoy the 20s, what we know as the jazz age. And of course, car ownership helped lead people to arrive at the cinemas. Look at this strong use of advertising and publicity for these films. You can also sense the charm of certain film stars here. Charlie Chaplin, for example, for his great personality, Clara Bow because of her inspiration in terms of the flapper culture, and Rudolf Valentino, a real um, sex appeal being delivered by the star. When Valentino died, there was a great deal of heartache in across America. Secondly, we look at jazz music. When we refer to the roaring 20s, we often think of people having money to spend and more time to listen to jazz music at this time. It was a southern state music. Jazz was much more rhythmic and lively than its predecessors. It was easy to dance to. It also associated with young people smoking and drinking, and according to some, behaving indecently. Some, of course, not all American people participated in jazz and such issues. Some college students, for example, were willing to challenge their parents' views and lifestyles. The number of 
Black musicians became very famous, such as Louis Armstrong and Bessie Smith. Listening to the radio was probably the most popular and accessible form of entertainment. With regards to jazz, there were a number of daring dances, like the Charleston and the Black Bottom, became very popular with youngsters. But of course, some parents were shocked by the ch children's enthusiasm for this jazz music and the, the dances it led to. Before we move on, some intriguing examples here of famous jazz clubs like the Cotton Club. Some of the famous jazz musicians are shown here, plus the dances. And you get the sense from the main photograph that jazz music gave a certain identity and a sense of togetherness and enjoyment. And it was certainly embraced by the flapper lifestyle of the 1920s. In relation to number six, I'd now like to spend a little bit of time looking at the changes to women's lives at this time. Let's just spend a moment trying to understand the importance of this decade in American history. We can see a number of things here, can't we? We can see the importance of advertising, where American females are targeted as a key target consumer audience. We can also sense the, the great style and confidence of the flapper culture. Also the confidence with the young Americans embracing strenuous sports like tennis. Politically, there was a change in the growth of the suffrage movement and as a result, the right to vote being granted post World War One. And of course, perhaps more rare and more surprising at the time was strenuous activities like motorcycle riding during the 1920s. So what do we learn? First of all, attitudes with regards to etiquette and behaviour. Women start to smoke in public. It was acceptable to drive cars and take part in energetic sports like tennis, I mentioned. The young women were known as flappers. The Hollywood films, the period characterized them as such. And their behavior and dress sense was imitated by millions around the world. And of course, mostly in the Northern states of the United States. Many or some young women rebelled against the old fashioned clothes of their mother's era or their grandmother's eras also. Of course, it went out of fashion, came all the rage women to cut their hair in a bob and wear a lot of makeup and jewellery. One famous prominent example of a flapper was indeed Joan Crawford, beginning her career as a dancer on Broadway before moving to Hollywood to make a name for herself. I've included some interesting examples here of the flapper lifestyle. Again, daring behaviour rebellious behaviour, confident behaviour, some taboos were being challenged, for example, smoking in public. And as we can see, it's utilised in marketing, in the ever popular Life magazine, for example. Furthermore, with regards to women's lives, the jazz clubs played a crucial role in allowing the flappers to express themselves. They could smoke and dance, they could drink illegal alcohol in the what we know as speakeasies. Instead of dancing the waltz before the war, they now started to enjoy more daring dances like the shimmy, for example. But of course, we need to be cautious here. Not every female in America enjoyed the flapper's way of life. Not every uh, female was able to afford the flapper's way of life. Some did not agree. If you look at the third point down, many women in the Bible Belt did not adopt this new way of life. Many objected to it. Many were outraged by this rebellious behaviour. Some joined the Anti-Flirt League or the Anti-Flirt Club. Some elder generations did not approve of this rebellious way of life. Some did not participate. 
was mostly young and rich women who enjoyed the new way of life. Often young middle class white women in particular. Many people who were poor could not afford these new fashions or the new technology or the cars or the entrance fee to jazz clubs. So they did not participate in these social changes. Sadly, many black females could not benefit either, either in terms of confidence, economic ability to participate, but also not being allowed to go in certain parts of speakeasies. Some in the Bible Belt in the Deep South did not adopt this way of life either. As I said earlier, many elder generations were outraged and joined the Anti-Flirt League. How else did women's lives change? Before the war, girls were expected to behave modestly and wear long dresses. When they went out, they had to be accompanied by an elder woman or a married woman. What we know as a chaperone. Many were given traditionally associated female jobs like servants, seamstresses, secretaries and nursing. This changed rather dramatically during World War I. Women would start to be employed in different types of jobs like factory work, replacing the males who had gone to fight in the Great War in Europe. Where does this lead to? Due to the war effort, it was hard to refuse these demands. As I said earlier, they had the right to vote granted in 1920. Also, we get the first woman to be elected governor of a state in 1924. There's also a change in terms of numbers of women working. 25% rise of females working in the 1920s. By 29, 10.6 million women were working. There's an also a rise in independence of the middle classes. And above all, they had more money to spend. As I mentioned earlier, they became a real target for campaigns by advertising companies to sell these new consumer goods, these new wonderful products, as they were advertised as being wonderful. So I spent some time looking at the United States. Now, I'd like to spend a little bit of time devoting to the Nazi Germany module. I'm going to pick out two key questions in particular. Number three, we're going to look at the rise of Hitler. Why did the Weimar Republic actually collapse? We spend some time looking at Hitler's quote. You can see the direction Hitler wanted to take Germany in terms of supremacy and stability and strength. And as you can see, he blames the Weimar Republic for the chaos as he saw it post World War I. And then obviously the Weimar Republic is blamed for the economic disaster which accompanied the Wall Street crash in the United States. What about the Nazi party? Hitler takes over the party in 1920 and changed the party's name. And he planned a violent revolution against the Weimar government helped by the SA, Hitler's private army. This Munich Putsch does fail, and Hitler is sent to prison in Landsberg prison, and the party was then banned. Following his prison sentence, of course, the ban was lifted. But Hitler's ideas were published in his book, Mein Kampf, as in My Struggle, which he writes alongside Rudolf Hess while in prison in his short period. So how did the party change? It to, um, Hitler toured the country, giving speeches, blaming the Jews, the communists, Versailles and the Weimar politicians, the problems, what we call as uh, the November criminals. Hitler promised during the Great Depression certain improvements, work freedom and bread in particular, as shown in the striking propaganda poster on the right side. Goebbels, who was photographed here, ran an effective propaganda campaign, a very negative campaign against his enemies, but also one which glorified the role of Hitler, the Führer. The Nazi newspapers convinced lots of people to support the Nazis. You can see a real rise here in popularity of the party. 1928, 
for 12 seats in the Reichstag, the German parliament. By September 30, 107 seats. So what is striking is the general, genuine rise of the Nazi party in terms of a real effective threat to Weimar democracy. So how do we assess the Great Depression? American loans to Germany were ended, of course, due to the Wall Street crash. But reparations payments still continued. Trade fell, damaging businesses in Germany. Factory workers lost their jobs in many places. Many farm workers lost their money. By 32, 6 million Germans are unemployed, which is a striking, alarming and scary figure, isn't it? What could the Republic do? For example, to try to solve the food shortages, Brunin, the Chancellor, was known as the Hunger Chancellor due to his, what he saw as necessary changes, but were seen as cutting changes for the poor German unemployed. We also have what we call political intrigue or backstage intrigue, even to Hitler becoming Chancellor. Hitler does not take power, he's handed the Chancellor role by von Hindenburg, the President, who is shown on the right side. We had num numerous problems facing democracy, rising unemployment, rising costs of unemployment benefits. Chancellors could not pass laws to improve the economy. It was a failure to work together, as you had coalition parties or coalition governments in place due to the use of PR as a voting system. The special concern is the actual amount of Nazi seats in the Reichstag, November 32. Clearly, they're now the biggest party. And due to the PR system, they can exercise a considerable amount of political clout within the Reichstag. This often resulted in Article 48 being used or subjected to when there was an issue with regards to consensus not being met. Three successive chancellors failed, of course. Von Papen, von Schleicher, and, and then, of course, von Papen convinced Hindenburg that if Hitler was chancellor, he would make sure Hitler did as he was told. Making Hitler squeak in the corner, evidently. So that was some time spent on the rise of Hitler. So the last one to discuss is how the Nazis consolidated their power. Hitler becomes chancellor, January 1933. And there are four key events which lead to the rise of a more position of authority on Hitler's behalf. What we call often illegal revolution. So they could destroy the Republic from within. And in a sense, done via democratic and legal procedures. So what are these four events? Number one is the Reichstag fire. Hitler asks Hindenburg to call an election to try to get more support in the Reichstag. The SA begin a brutal election campaign, one of intimidation, of course, and the Reichstag fire is set, sorry, the Reichstag building is set on fire. The communist who was arrested may well have started it, or it may well have been a part of a frame up, or perhaps the Nazis used this to try to show an element of conspiracy, to show that the communists are the real guilty party here. Hitler argued the communists were planning a revolution, of course, so many were arrested and the party was banned. Free speech was restricted as a result. Many enemies of the state were imprisoned without trial and sent to camps like Dachau, which was set up in 1933, and left-wing newspapers were banned effectively. Maybe the Nazis set the fire themselves, or maybe Van der Lubbe was a lone individual who was then exploited so they could begin the process of eliminating other communists at this time. The second event is the Enabling Act. This enables Hitler to ban the communists from attending so in this discussion to enable the Enabling Act to be passed, the communists are not allowed to attend the event. SA men prevent known opponents from entering the, the building. And we get a real example of repression here. 
while members of the Reichstag are voting on whether the Enabling Act gets passed. When it was passed, it allowed Hitler to pass laws without consulting the Reichstag so he could establish his own dictatorship. As a consequence, unions were banned, strikes were made illegal, parties were banned by the law against formation of parties, so new parties could not exist. This enabled Hitler to have more control, of course, of the government, what we call the Gleichschaltung, so more coordination on Hitler's part to now achieve what we call a dictatorship. The third event is the Night of the Long Knives, where Röhm, leader of the SA, was seen as an effective threat. It was believed that Röhm wanted to bring in the SA and the German army together, hoping for a social revolution. But Hitler saw this as a threat to his power. Leaders were told to have a holiday and meet in a hotel near Munich at the end of the month. At that point, they're then arrested. And these are called the Night of the Long Lines. Well, over 400 enemies of the state were arrested and shot for the SS, including some of Hitler's older enemies, like the former Chancellor von Schleicher. Hitler basically had a wish list, which was then used. This is used to remove opponents to Hitler's regime and secure the support of the army at the same time, and making the SS the main figurehead of security and terror. The fourth event and final event is the death of Hindenburg. Hitler was then able to combine the role of president and chancellor into one new job as the Führer of Germany. So he was now head of state and commander in chief. Commander in chief sorry. At the same time, the army then swore an oath of loyalty to him as their Führer. So many historians would now argue that at this state, due to these four events, Hitler was now dictator of Germany. So in terms of the presentation, that is the, we're now finished, but I will say I will do more Germany questions next week in the next session. Thank you.